Welcome to the Rideshare Guy podcast, where you will learn about the rideshare and mobility industry straight from Harry Campbell, who's got over five years experience covering the industry and has talked to thousands of drivers. There's no better place to stay up to date, entertained, and educated. So let's dive in. So Sam Dogan started Financial Samurai in 2009, one of the largest independently owned personal finance blogs with over 1 million page views a month. In 2012, Sam decided to fake retire at age 34 after spending 13 years working in the finance industry. He's the author of the new new best-selling book, By This, Not That, How to Spend Your Way to Wealth and Freedom. And I think he's got a couple kids that might be a, a side job too. So Sam, how are you doing today? Good. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm excited to chat. As you know, uh, you and I, uh, I think, are pretty good friends, and we go back a ways. And uh, I actually don't know if my listeners and viewers know that I actually first got started in blogging in the personal finance space. So your site was one that I always read and uh, you know appreciated. And so I guess it inspired me to start my own sites and the Rideshare Guy and all that. So thank you for that. Yeah, no worries, man. So uh, you've got a blog, Financial Samurai. Before we dive into the book, tell me a little bit more about the blog, the business. Uh, you know, one thing that stood out to me in your bio is that you're one of the largest independently owned personal finance blogs with over 1 million page views a month. 1 million page views a month sounds like a lot, but it also sounds like maybe, I don't know, a dig or is it, hey, there are a lot of others that are big and out there, but they've got a big team. You know, how do you think about the landscape of personal finance uh, sites out there? It's definitely not a dig. I mean, when I started in 2009, I just thought, hey, I got to write out my feelings because the world was mm -hmm. falling apart during the global financial crisis. Um, but it's just a one man shop. Well, my wife definitely helps with the back end. And it's just a place for me to write about everything personal finance, the journey that I've gone through. I write everything based on firsthand experience, mm -hmm. the good and the bad to try to yeah. help people, you know, avoid the landmines. And they're everywhere when it comes to money. Yeah. What do you think of the topics are that you're best known for or that even you enjoy most writing about? I like writing about early retirement, fake retirement. Mm -hmm. uh, I love entrepreneurship, real estate, investing in the stock market. That was my career for 13 years on Wall Street. So anything that has to do with creativity uh, and generating more income and wealth is something that's right up my alley. But now as a father of two children, five and a half and two and a half years old, I'm totally fascinated with parenting as well. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, I guess there's a financial element of that, but uh, there's also a lot, a lot else going on. How do, how do you sort of tie that into, you know, your site? I mean, you are a financial samurai. Do you kind of cover parenting or do you always tie it back to find the financial side of things? I tie it back with uh, the category family finances, right? Mm -hmm. So money is one of our most important tools to live a fantastic life, a life that we want to live. And so I think about parenting in, in, in terms of, you know, time and money spent on our children, how much we spend too much, too little, how much time we should spend and so forth. Because at the end of the day, as parents, we just want to have uh, well-adjusted children who uh, give us a ring every once in a while, once they've left the nest. Yeah, definitely. Cool. Well, uh, as you know, I've got two boys myself, so definitely on the same page there. So you've been writing uh, since 2009. How many articles have you written on uh, Financial Samurai, you think? I think I've probably written over 2,500 articles now. So wow. three articles a week plus, well, three articles a week every week since 2009, July. And that was a promise that I made in July 2009 when I said, you know what, if I'm going to start something, I'm going to stay consistent and see what happens because I think so yeah. many times, you know, we work on something, a new idea, and then we look to the left and we find another idea and we just get distracted. So I figured if I could keep it up for 10 years in a row, <laughs> good things could happen. And yeah. something good did happen, which was financial samurai gave me the courage and the interest to do something new beyond traditional finance. So in 2012, I left and negotiated a severance. And I said, you know what? I got something to do besides travel and kick back and play tennis. I've got something creative to do that I yeah. really enjoy, which is to write on Financial Samurai. What do you think uh, was the key to your success with Financial Samurai? Was it more about the consistency? Was it more you think that you're a good writer? Or people really empathize with your story? If you had to pick one thing, uh, you know, because I think that in my audience and especially out there, right, content creation and, you know, media and being an influencer is very in vogue these days. And mm -hmm. I'll give you my answer, but I'd love to hear you for your, for your take first. There is no one answer. Um, well, you have so, to pick one. This is a high pressure podcast. <laughs> <laughs> uh, consistency then consistency consistency don't quit if you can breathe forever you can yeah. write forever 
Yeah. I think that's actually something I might've learned from you. Cause I feel like you mentioned that in your articles pretty consistently and have touched on this, you know, the fact that like, you know, you set these goals for yourself and, you know, you do three, four posts or, you know, a couple posts a week for years on end. And, you know, I think a lot of times if you just put good stuff out there, you know, honestly, whether it's online or, you know, your own business, you're just kind of like, I call it like never dying basically, right? Like we work with a lot of startups that just like, for whatever reason, they just won't go under and then good opportunities, you know, start to compound and people start to find you or they remember you. And so I do think that consistency is really important when it comes to creating content online, but even business more broadly. Yeah. I mean, eventually someone will find you. You're going to attract um, like-minded people or people who find your product or your words interesting. At the yeah. end of the day, it's the internet, right? People are going to find what they're looking for. And it's so much easier now than 25 years ago. Yeah. So last question on this before we dive into the book, what keeps you going and what keeps you motivated? Because you know me, I'm kind of lazy, right? I started off writing every article for my blog, the rideshare guy, three, four articles a week. I did that pretty consistently for one, two, three years. And then I started hiring people and editing, which is a bit easier, right? And sort of transition to other roles of the business. And we use multiple contributors on the blog and the YouTube channel, and I guess everything but the podcast. But you, I think pretty much still write almost every single article that comes out on yeah. uh, your blog, Financial Samurai, and now you have the book. So what's been the motivating factor? Because that's tough. I don't know how you did it. Well, one, I like to write. So if I didn't enjoy what I'm doing, then I would have yeah. quit many, many years ago. Two, I don't like managing people. One of the mm -hmm. reasons why I left my business, uh, the finance mm -hmm. business was because there was a lot of office politics. Yeah. I had to manage a couple employees. They always had some issues. It was a lot of tension and stress, and it was unproductive time spent. Yeah. And so for me, I like to write and I could, if I could efficiently write something that's meaningful to me or entertaining or real time, I thought that was the most efficient way. And again, I didn't start it, start Financial Samurai because I wanted to make money. I wanted to start mm -hmm. it because there was a lot of chaos and yeah. I wanted to connect with people and figure things out during a really uncertain time. And Definitely. sure, over time it's grown and then there's online income and other opportunities such as the book by this, not that. However, my main desire is to just write and anything that comes on top of writing, whether it's, you know, income or speaking opportunities or whatever, that's just gravy bonus, you know, because yeah. it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't move the needle so much for me versus mm -hmm. the act of creating. <clears throat> Yeah. All right. So drum roll, please. We're now going to talk about the book. I think uh, I really appreciate all the background. I think, uh, you know, definitely uh, everyone should go check out Financial Samurai, the, the website and the blog. Uh, you've got a library of great content, uh, but you know, you're here to talk about the book. And I think you've got a nice uh, provocative title. I'm sure uh, that all your haters online, you know, will, uh, will love this title because it does, you know, I guess the subtitle, How to Spend Your Way to Wealth and Freedom. I guess that's kind of the kicker. So instead of, you know, I'm sure you're going to go do a lot of interviews. They're going to ask you what the book is about. I'm going to say to you, picture this, uh, you're in the backseat of an Uber in San Francisco and uh, you get in and you talk, start talking to the driver. He asks you what you do. You tell him that you have a new book out and he asks you, what's it about? What's your answer to him going to be? Oh, it's pretty or simple. Uh, <laughs> the book, buy this, not that, how to spend your way to wealth and freedom is exactly the subtitle. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, how to achieve financial freedom sooner rather than later. And money is just a tool, right? Whatever choice, uh, well, first of all, whatever choice you make is a, a choice you don't make with something else. So the idea, mm -hmm. the book is to help you make optimal decisions in everything you do, whether it's your money, your investing, whether it's your personal life and your relationships, getting that job, moving to a different city, uh, you know, marrying someone. Yeah. The idea is to think in probabilities instead of absolutes. And what do I mean by that? I mean, instead of thinking you need 100% certainty to make a decision, think in probabilities, like what if this could come true? So I use a 70-30 decision-making framework where if you believe there is a 70% chance or greater, the decision is the correct one, go for it. Mm -hmm. While knowing with humility that 30% of the time you're gonna get it wrong, but you're gonna learn from your mistakes and make better decisions going forward. So the book is really a firsthand experience while taking in literally 90 million plus people's perspectives mm -hmm. who've come on Financial Samurai since 2009 and trying to help you avoid the landmines to help you make more optimal decisions in everything you do. Got it. So I guess uh, what would be one uh, good example in real life uh, of this using the 70-30 decision framework? Oh, 
So many examples. So one would be <laughs> simply, should I start my side business or not? Okay. So you can say, well, what are the downsides of starting the side business? Cost and time, maybe embarrassment, public failure. Mm -hmm. um, and then what are the upsides? Uh, the upsides are joy, creativity, connecting with others, income, being able to quit your job, whatever. So you stack up those pros and cons and you have to make a decision. You don't know exactly sure whether it's 70% right probability, but it forces you to speak to people who've done what you want to do, do mm -hmm. that research. And then it forces you to understand people who failed at those uh, probabilities of becoming a solopreneur or whatever, and try to understand where they went wrong so you can increase your probability of success. And so it's, it's really a regret minimization framework. It's mm -hmm. a what's the worst that could happen to you framework. And for me, yeah. when I started in 2009, I said, well, the worst that could happen was, uh, you know, I spend time and I lose 500 bucks because I helped well, I paid for someone to help me launch the site and do all the design and everything. Right. But the upside was just huge uh, because yeah. it could turn into something and it ultimately helped me escape a job I didn't like after two and a half years of writing on Financial Samurai. Yeah. How did you know what the sort of potential upside was, right? Because I mean, I imagine like, I think a good example that I always tell people, right? If you type like how to make money online into Google mm -hmm. or into YouTube, you're going to get some like pretty crazy results. And, you know, probably I wouldn't trust those folks too much. So like in a situation like that, if I, how do I, you know, I'm thinking about starting a side hustle. I'm thinking about starting a website kind of like you did. Like, how do I know what the upside might be? Well, you know, by looking at the case studies online, um, you mm -hmm. know, I have, I have a, a post called how much can you make money blogging mm -hmm. and I telegraph by year what is the potential of 70% of the people who stick to writing two to three times a week in the yeah. personal yeah. finance space can make and that is based on my experience after the past 13 years I'm just one case study you've got food bloggers you've got well your site. I guess that's sort of my question right is yeah. that I think that like I know your site and you know if someone asked me I would tell them to go read something like yours or you know show them the good resources but like how does like you know Joe Schmo off the street like find your site right you know that's sort of like I think like a challenge like there's a lot of good info out there but there's also a lot of bad info out there right so like mm. there's got to be some skill like how do you parse like who knows what they're talking about <laughs> and who doesn't or how do you see like like for me I know an eye-opening moment was uh, when I saw actually you know I, I think you know him uh, Jim Wang who started the site bargaineering. I remember it sold to bank rate for $3 million. It was a personal finance blog. And this was like 10 or 20 years ago. And I was thinking to myself like, whoa, blogs can sell for $3 million. <laughs> like, that's crazy. You know, this looks yeah. like just any old site. And, uh, that was to me, like kind of when the light bulb went off, like, hell, I, mean, I hear people like talking all this, you know, crazy stuff online about how much money they're making and this and that. And it's like, that's a hard number. This is like reported in an actual media outlet. So it's a lot more trustworthy than, you know, some guy talking on TikTok, for example. Hmm. Well, there you go. I mean, you have public reports on acquisitions of sites in any space that you want, yeah. I mean, whether it's a personal finance, you know, pet store space, there's, there's public data everywhere. And um, it's just so easy to find. I mean, yeah, trusting numbers might be tough, but I, I've, I've come to the conclusion that I trust a lot of things mm. because it gives me the inspiration to try. You yeah. know, like some kid, Ryan, whatever, from YouTube, he reviews toys <laughs> and he makes 30 million a year. Yeah. In the beginning, I was like, that's crazy. But I was like, eh, it's probably true. Yeah. And it's just, you have to believe you deserve to be rich. You, mm -hmm. you have to believe that you deserve to be in the arena. Yeah. So it sounds like you're an optimist. And one other thing that you said really stood out to me, because this is something that I often tell people thinking about working in the gig economy or thinking about trying out a new platform to drive for or deliver for is like, what's the downside, right? Like, I think it's important to do your research, do a little due diligence. But one of the things that I love about the gig economy is that you're really like starting your own business, but you've got leads coming, you know, if you're going to go drive from Uber, you literally turn the app on and they start sending you clients and you can't lose money. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, there yeah. are a lot of businesses where you can waste time or waste money like with uber it's impossible to lose money i would you know like almost bet a lot i would bet a uh, quite a bit of money you know that from almost uh most most people are in most situations almost every situation actually i'd be pretty confident that it's hard mm -hmm. to lose money um what do you think i would say you're right uh 80 of the time <clears throat> uh i would say 20 of the time you lose money from gas to getting tickets 
to door dings, to flat tires. That's true. Some, You're right. Okay. There are, yeah, if car. you kind of, yeah, that's true. I guess if like you go dr start driving and you get into an accident on your first trip, you're going to be, yeah. So you, that's spend fair. So it's probably overwhelming hours, majority of the time. <laughs> you spend three hours thinking you're going to make 60 to a hundred dollars and you only find one ride and he takes you on a joy ride. I don't know. There, you, there's no absolutes. Then that, yeah, that's, that's, that's true. My point. That's true. Um, and, you know, I think one thing, uh, you know, that stood out too is that, well, I guess you tell me, like, who, who is your book uh, designed for? Is it for people making a lot of money? Is it people like, who are you thinking about when you're writing this book? Because I'm curious, like, I feel like you've always written from your firsthand experience, you know, working in finance and starting a blog and living in San Francisco. I'm sure you get complaints from people who are like, oh, this doesn't work for me. You know, I'm in some other city or oh, I don't make that much money. So how do you think about, uh, you know, sort of serving everyone? Well, you can't serve everyone. That's mm -hmm. one of the keys to business and work. But you can be authentic in your your knowledge and your skills and sharing. So mm -hmm. the book is there to serve anybody who is in a situation where they find it to be a suboptimal situation and they want to do more of what they want. Any kind of stress you experience, most of the stress you experience is largely due to other people, actually. It's kind of funny. Mm -hmm. You know, and so the book is for anybody who wants to build more wealth to give themselves more optionality to do what they want. It's not about large numbers, because if you talk about percentages, which I basically talk about most in the book, it's all relative. It, it can relate to anybody from any kind of income mm -hmm. spectrum. The percentages are the percentages, whether you save 10 percent, 20 percent of a fifty thousand dollar income or a million dollar income. The percentages are the percentages and your returns are the percentage returns. It's irregardless after you've achieved a baseline level of income that you can survive on. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. You know, one thing too that, uh, you know, I was thinking about when you were talking earlier about, you know, sort of like starting a side business or not. I know a lot of people when I started driving for Uber and Lyft, you know, I was working as an aerospace engineer for Boeing, making a pretty good salary. And uh, I started driving for Uber and Lyft on the side. And a lot of people almost like made fun of me, you know, sort of like, hey, this is, yeah. seems like below you, beneath you. Right. And what was funny is actually on a per hour basis, I was actually making more driving for mm -hmm. Uber, you know, eight, nine years ago than I was at my day job, obviously in very limited limited hours. But, um, you know, you also drove for Uber, right? So I'm curious, you know, what was, uh, let's talk a little bit about, about your Uber driver driving experience, you know, kind of how that uh, feeds into your financial philosophy. Why did you, uh, you know, sort of a successful financial blogger and guy in the finance industry sign up to drive for Uber? Well, I gave over 500 Uber rides, uh, yeah. because I saw other people do it, and they would give like one or two rides, and that'd be it. And then they'd <laughs> write a story. Yeah. And I also wanted to I saw the funny thing about Uber corporate employees not driving for Uber. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was kind of a double standard. Like, don't you want to experience the true yeah. value of your product? So I said, you know what? Let's not do two or three or let's do 500. Yeah. <laughs> and so after 500 rides, you have a great idea of what the product is like. You yeah. can and write this about back it. in 2017? Uh, yeah, earlier, 2015. Okay. 2015. And so... Because I write everything from firsthand experience. Yeah. And the more experience you have, the more authority and credibility you have. So I wanted to have that firsthand experience to drive and then to learn tactics to help people. And you know, you can generate affiliate income from signups as you knew, mm -hmm. as you know. Uh, but I also wanted to hear stories about, you know, people, the people that I picked up. Yeah. And you know, I would ride, you know, drive from like 5 a.m. to 8 a.m. before my family woke up. So I can hear their stories and wonder what people do with their lives at this, mm -hmm. this hour or maybe 10 p.m. or whatever. Yeah. And uh, what I discovered was that, you know, we all have similar wants and needs, right? We want to take care of our family, want to earn enough income, we want to be respected. But I also saw a lot of uh, difficulty, mm -hmm. some poverty. Uh, one time I picked up um, a family at Target and they were so grateful that I came because two other drivers came and went because the family had a bunch of uh, stuff that they had mm -hmm. bought. And so I said, you know what, oh, let's just fit it into my hatchback Honda Fit and we'll do it. And I think in retrospect, I think it was illegal to have so much stuff for like, I don't know, they had like a kid and I needed some kind of seat or whatever. Yeah. And I dropped them at uh, these housing, uh, housing projects. And, you know, on the way, they told me a story about how the wife uh, is a janitor at the airport. 
I don't know, he was the janitor at the airport and she was stay at home mom and how much they made and how, you know, they were making like $12 an hour. And they're just trying to really figure things out with their kid and how much housing costs, what is public subsidized housing costs. So I learned their stories. And by learning someone else's stories, you're able to better empathize with that yeah. type of person, that person. Uh, because I think we all live in this kind of bubble. You know, you have, let's say you have millions of dollars or you have enough passive income to not have to work. Yeah. You then hang out with other people who are kind of in the same social status sphere, right? And so then you tend to kind of lose touch with other people. And so I thought it was a really great way to connect with different types of people from different types of backgrounds. Yeah, no, I really like that. And obviously, you know, I think a lot of people are attracted, you know, I, I would argue to, you know, almost most jobs, you know, they do it for the money, especially in the gig economy, you know, people like the flexibility, but they're doing it because it's a job, they need money. But there are a lot of nice, uh, you know, what I call side benefits, right? The people that you get to pick up, the stories that you learn, the empathy that you develop, um, you know, so you've done, you know, quite a bit of Uber driving, you're obviously an experienced finance blogger, and now uh, hopefully best selling author in the financial advice space. So what financial advice would you have uh, specifically? specifically for gig workers, you know, with all this uh, finance experience and the fact that you've given over 500 uh, Uber rides? Well, also the other reason why I wanted to give so many was because you could start gaming the system in the sense that mm -hmm. you figure out when were the best hours, the best routes, turn off the app, all that stuff, right? We all know this. And uh, so the best- Well, not everyone. Time, That's why I have a, a business. That's what we talk about. <laughs> yeah. And you, you guys obviously know all about it. My best, one of my most basic but best advice for finance is if the amount of money you're saving each month doesn't hurt, mm -hmm. you're not saving enough. Mm -hmm. So the idea behind that is don't wing it when it comes to your finances, right? You make your money driving, you save, and then you spend it and it's done. And then you yeah. wake up five to 10 years later and you wonder where all your money went. Where's that plan? Yeah. Where's your money, right? And so the idea is, if it doesn't hurt, it means you're just winging it. You're not yeah. paying attention to where your money is going, your net worth asset allocation, how you're investing, you know, what you're spending your money on. Yeah. And so this is like really important where if you want to achieve more financial independence, you've got to pay attention. You've got to plan and you've got to surround yourself and listen to people who are thinking about the same thing. You've got to really yeah. be immersed, just like if you're an Uber driver or you know, delivery, DoorDash, whatever it is, you gotta be immersed in this culture so that you know you're motivated more to make more money and to make money smarter. And yeah. that's the same thing with achieving financial independence. Yeah. And I think it kind of lines up too with what we were talking earlier about consistency. You know, I mean, almost like I'm sure there have been times where you want to, you know, you didn't want to write that extra post. You didn't want to get up at 5 a.m. and do another post, right? But it's sort of like it has to hurt a little bit in order to, you know, know that you're doing a good job, right? A lot of drivers, I think, might go out there and set a $100 or $200 per day goal. And it's like they get there and they're done. But it's like, you know what? If you're driving and it's busy, you know, push for that one extra ride, right? Like do that one more and then pocket yeah. that and save that. So I think that's a uh, pretty, pretty good advice another and, another advice yeah keep going is, is to follow you because think <laughs> about leverage right so you can only yeah. make so much money driving per hour so ideally mm -hmm. you want to think about your leverage where you can make more money and so that leverage comes from the easiest way is referral bonuses right and so mm -hmm. you have a platform where you can talk about your driving write about it and generate referral leads whether it's through grubhub doordash uber lyft whatever yeah. it is and leverage your experience to make more money that way as well. Leverage is, is, is a huge key to generating more income. Got it. So if you were a driver in that situation, you were looking to leverage, what would be the specific, specific thing? Would it be start a blog, go do a YouTube, yeah. go do a TikTok? What would you, like if it was you, what would you pick? If you Anything pick you want to do to own your platform, mm -hmm. right? Your platform can be your blog, YouTube, TikTok. I mean, TikTok is crazy now. TikTok is just generating so many leads. There's so much stickiness. Yeah. And I, I, maybe I would do TikTok and focus on that. It seems to be working very well. Uh, clearly like Facebook and Snapchat, they're all talking about how TikTok is taking away uh, mindshare time. Yeah. So own your platform because once you own your platform, you have more control and you have more leverage. You got to leverage the internet. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it definitely seems like you're a big fan of, you know, sort of the side hustles and the sort of starting your own business and, you know, kind of really digital, it sounds like online yeah, I mean, it's, content. It's unbelievable how many opportunities we have online to make money. Uh, it's just endless. I mean, take advantage of it because 25 years ago, 
I am Gen X. So I grew up in high school and freshman year in college with no internet. Mm-hmm. And now it's like, you don't have to do the day job. You can do the gig. You can leverage the internet. It's just an endless amount of money to make. So go, go ahead and get it. Yeah. So are there any other examples or chapters from your book that you think uh, sort of, you know, you're, you know, encompass this uh, mindset of yours that you think is uh, the most powerful? Um, you know, if you have that mindset where you believe you deserve to be rich, you mm-hmm. deserve all that's all that you want. It's a it's an offensive mindset. Yeah. Um, think about it versus like a defensive mindset. Someone with low self-esteem, low confidence doesn't deserve to be there. If that's what you believe, that's what you're going to get. Think about um, here, like one of the best examples is I remember Yahoo, Mm -hmm. Yahoo, the company, they hired a CEO, you know, tens of millions of dollars a year in income. Yeah. And I think he lied on his resume about something, right? And then he got (laughs) let go. And then he walked away with tens of millions of dollars in severance. Yeah. So here's a guy who lied on his resume, got huge money. He got let go and he got tens of millions of dollars. Um, we work, um, as an amazing company that grew huge and then it kind of imploded. Um, but the founder got a billion dollar severance. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's a little bit apples and oranges because he was the founder, but my point is people are making tons of money all the time and they might not be deserved. They might've tanked their company to the ground and they still get paid tremendous amounts of money. So you have to have that mindset where I deserve to win that tennis match. I deserve to grow my platform. I deserve to grow financial samurai, whatever it is. Because once you go on that offensive and you believe, so many good things happen. Yeah. Well, and I think that definitely love the sort of offensive mindset. And I mean, what about, you know, the sort of people that think like, oh, you know what? Like, I don't want to be that person, that Adam Newman, right? Like he didn't do a good job, you know, at WeWork or, you know, he kind of imploded the company. Like, how do you kind of balance the two? Like, I like the mindset that you deserve to be rich. You deserve to be win win and be offensive. But I'm sure that some people out there would think to themselves, like, you know, I almost feel like we see this a lot in the gig economy, you know, drivers, like they're very trusting of Uber, right? And I often tell people like Uber doesn't have your back. They're looking out for their best interests and you need to look out for yours. But there are a lot of people out there that honestly, like, I feel like are very trusting, (laughs) you know? Yeah. Well, we'll turn it around, keep on thinking positive, right? So it's like, if people who are blowing up their companies are getting millions of dollars, uh, if you're a good worker, good employee, good entrepreneur helping, why, why, why can't you deserve the same amount or even much more? Yeah. Um, So it's, it, a lot of people don't start something because they don't believe they deserve to be there. Yeah. And when my epiphany moment was in 2009, where this is guy, he was 26 years old and he, he wrote a book on how to be rich mm-hmm. and he was only 26 years old and he wasn't rich. And then I was like, well, you <laughs> know what? If someone can do that, then why can't I do that? Cause I have 10 years experience at that time. So the idea is you don't have to wait. You don't have to think you have to know it all or be an expert. You'll figure it out on the way. Yeah. Fake it till you make it. Someone, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, the last thing that I want to ask you about, and I'm curious if you touched on it in your book, because it's sort of a recent development, but as this sort of looming uh, recession, you know, we hear a lot of people talking about, um, you know, recession, R word, and, you know, negative, you know, stock market going down and all that. So what what advice are you giving to people right now in general, whether you're an Uber driver, whether you're someone, you know, making a million bucks a year, like how should you be thinking about this looming, you know, economic state, right? Is now the time yeah. to sort of start squirreling away all the nuts or, you know, make more or work Carter, what, what are you telling people? And, you know, I guess, what are you doing yourself? So we're probably in a recession already. Uh, mm-hmm. Second quarter 2022 GDP is probably down and we were down in the first quarter. So we're probably in a recession. So welcome it with open arms. It's not like suddenly when the government says we're in a recession, things go down to hell, right? Yeah. We're kind of already baking that in with the stock market down 20%, uh, real estate slowing down, businesses slowing in general. Um, So my advice is to take stock of your spending and to build relationships, better relationships now with your employees and your bosses. Mm. Because if you have a day job, the people who get let go the first are the people who are out of sight, out of mind. Mm -hmm. So that means if you've been working from home for a while, you might want to pop your face in. (laughs) Grab lunch. What's up? How you doing? You know, let's go for lunch or drinks. Show your face. Yeah. If you haven't connected with your colleagues or your boss in a while, just like virtually, you know, have a one-on-one with them because it's much harder to let people you like and you mm-hmm. know go. So take stock of your cash, 
build your cash reserves, take stock of your spending and build those relationships because the average recession, well, the average bear market lasts about a year and yeah. we're five to six months into that. Yeah. If you can last a year, you're probably going to do okay because you're going to be able to benefit from the rebound. And, and the other thing is most people don't get fired during a recession. You know, the recession, yeah. you, 90 plus percent of people working still have jobs and still keep their jobs. So you don't want to be the five to 10%, but inevitably sometimes you are, right? One out of 10 or one out of 20 times. Yeah. So the key is survival. Survive the down, time, down times because the good times will eventually come again. Definitely. Well, this is why I was excited to uh, have you on and ask you this question specifically. I think it's pretty obvious to, you know, start saving some money, but I think the relationships is key. That's something that I bet a lot of people miss, you know, now's the time to, you know, whether it's advertisers or whether it's people that you work with or, you know, anyone, you know, there's going to be a lot of people, you know, trying to build relationships once it's too late. So now is the time to yeah, start doing want, it. You don't want to be the guy who sends you a LinkedIn. Hey, what's up? <laughs> when you're about to lose your job or you have no job, right? Yeah. You want to build those relationships when you don't need anything. Yeah. You're just yeah. building the relationships because you're a good person and you want to help people. Yeah, definitely. Cool. Well, uh, I want to give you a chance to let everyone know when and where they can get this book. Um, and then also, you you know, some people's favorite segment, you get to ask me one question to end the podcast. So feel free, let us know, uh, you know, where they should go to get the book and, uh, you know, where you want them to buy it and release date and all that. And then I'll let you ask me one question. All right. Well, buy this, not that. How to Spend Your Way to Wealth and Freedom is out July 19th. Yeah. You can buy it uh, financialsamurai.com forward slash BTNT stands for buy this, not that. You can go to anywhere you like to buy books. Uh, I think it's going to be the best personal finance book you'll ever read because it is thoroughly researched with a lot of action points and a lot of stories to help you avoid those landmines. And if you want to stay in touch with Financial Samurai, go to financialsamurai.com forward slash newsletter. And cool. this way you'll never miss a thing. Uh, in terms of questions for you. Well, you know what? We also oh. forgot to mention, I am in the book too, right? I'm looking at oh, page yeah. uh, 208 right now, uh, yeah, Samurai Side Hustle. So that's another good reason uh, for people. I see and I, I got a nice little uh, recognition in the book actually about my story that we kind of touched on. So that was cool yeah. to see. Yeah, definitely check out the book to support Harry and support the book. And you're never going to get rich buying a book. Uh, you're never going to get rich writing a book. Let me just put it this way. Uh, it I actually so just work. did. I actually just did a TikTok video about I, I hit 10,000 sales of the Rideshare Guide, oh, my good. book, and I haven't even earned back my $2,500 advance. So I'm still uh, right. hoping to break the 2,500 mark. So hopefully you'll do better than I did. Yeah. Well, but the point is that like, as a writer, uh, I'm a writer first and foremost. Yeah. I just want to be read. The yeah, money it was is definitely a rewarding thing. experience for sure. Yeah. But I think if you buy, buy this, not that. My promise to the readers is that you're going to gain at least 100 times more value than the cost of the book. And over time, because the compounding factor of wealth, it's going to go into the thousands. So that's my thought. All right. Good investment. So last uh, segment, you get to ask me your question. What do you got for me? So my question is, uh, how is your house hunting experience? And have you bought a new house yet? Uh, I haven't bought a new house yet. So, you know, we're here in Los Angeles, obviously not cheap. And, uh, you know, we've got a nice little three bedroom, two and a half bath house. But it, it was like, as soon as we had our, our, not fourth kid, our second kid, you know, which is now four people in the house, it was like, all of a sudden, it just seemed like a lot tighter. And, you know, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm it, growing up in LA, right, it just seems like we need like a little bit of extra space. And so, you know, it's kind of like, I would love to, you know, find something, but then the market, you know, was just so crazy, like, literally, in two years of looking, we only put one offer in on a new house, like that was the only one that we kind of felt comfortable. And then it got over bid by two or three hundred thousand dollars and was all cash and so it's sort of like yeah. we weren't even close and then now the market or you know the rates have all gone up so i sort of need to get i'm getting re-pre-qualified right now to see what i can afford and what the cost will be and what the interest rate so you know kind of like uh, maybe like uh, what you talk about in your book you know we sort of we might like a nicer newer bigger house but also you know we're sort of learning to be uh, happy and content with the house uh, that we have right now and the area that we're in because you know we're in a good neighborhood and got good uh friends yeah friends and family. And, you know, it definitely is a very convenient part of Los Angeles. I went downtown in about 12 minutes this morning to play basketball, came back here, do my interview, go to Santa Monica later for lunch meeting and, uh, you know, all over town. So very convenient. All right. So it sounds like you're adopting the, you're appreciating more of what you have, but I will tell you the deals are here and they're coming over the next six to 12 months. 
So be patient. There's going to be more deals to be had and mortgage rates are coming back down as inflation right. subsides and recessionary fears grow. So wow. the opportunity will be there. So cash up and be ready. Man, look at this. I got some free personal uh, finance advice for my own uh, situation. So appreciate it, Sam. All right. We'll look forward to the book. And I know I've got my copy coming in the mail soon. Excited to read it. All right, guys. Thanks a lot for the support. And uh, yeah, check out Harry in the book. I'm sure Buy it's going to do Buy this, not well. that. <laughs>